some double integrals just don't look very nice in terms of Cartesian rectangular coordinates. Um, either the integrand is nasty looking or, or the region itself just isn't nicely described in terms of Cartesian coordinates. And in so, uh, some of those problems, and all the ones we're going to look at today, um, the integrals become much nicer in polar coordinates. So instead of describing things in terms of x and y, um, you describe things in terms of r and theta, where r is the distance from the origin. And theta is, well, I'll, I will summarize it in a minute, but theta is an angle with the positive x-axis. Um, we do assume that you've seen polar coordinates in single variable calculus so that you just need a quick refresher. If, that's, um, if you don't remember polar coordinates or you never saw them, then you'll need to look in, um, in worldwide integral calculus or some integral calculus book on polar coordinates or, or you can read the section. It contains a brief summary of what you need on polar coordinates. But I will remind you, so you're in the xy plane. So R2. But instead of describing where this point is by specifying its x coordinate by dropping perpendiculars and specifying its x and y coordinates, in polar coordinates, you specify a distance from the origin, which you call r, and then the angle, the angle that that ray out to the point makes with the positive x-axis. So that means that this point, which had coordinates x, y in Cartesian coordinates, um, that the x coordinate is r cosine of theta and the y coordinate is r sine theta. So this is what you should remember of how, about how you switch from polar coordinates to Cartesian or rectangular coordinates. That if you specify an r and a theta, it determines x and y this way. And if you're given an x and a y, then you say that it has polar coordinates r and theta if r and theta satisfied this relationship with the given x and y. It does mean that every point in the xy plane has an infinite number of polar coordinates because you can let theta go around 360 degrees, 2 pi radians. Um, it's true that in single variable calculus we typically allow r to be positive or negative because it means that some, that some curves are very nicely some beautiful curves are very nicely described in terms of polar coordinates. But when you look at double integrals and look at um, integrating over regions, it's normal to assume, and we will, that r is greater than or equal to zero. Let me write that up here. r equals zero describes just the origin, regardless of your angle. If r is zero, regardless of what theta is, x and y are both zero. It's also true that if you, since r is the distance from the origin that x squared plus y squared equals r squared. You can, of course, also get that by, by squaring these two. You get x squared plus y squared equals r squared cosine squared plus r squared sine squared. Factor out the r squared, r squared times cosine squared plus sine squared. Fundamental trig identity, cosine squared plus sine squared is one. So you get this. And these are the three things you try to use to change um, rectangular, so Cartesian integrals, integrals given to you in terms of x and y, into nice integrals in terms of r and theta, except for one big problem. We, we need to look at dA, an infinitesimal chunk of area, in terms of r and theta, and dr and d theta. It is not just, you might think that, ah, well, in Cartesian coordinates, dA was dx dy, so in, in, in polar coordinates, dA will be dr d theta. No, that, the units wouldn't even be right. R has length units, but theta is, well, most people would say unitless, but it has radian units. It certainly wouldn't be, you wouldn't get distance squared units like you need for area. You really have to think about it. There are lots of ways to think about this. In the more depth part, um, there's a different explanation of what I'm about to write. But, Right now, what I want to look at is 
Ideally, I would draw this infinitesimally, what you, or you could work with deltas, small changes in R and small changes in theta, and then take limits um, rigorously. That is what we should do, and look at Riemann sums. But I'm going to draw, I'm going to work infinitesimally and write d of, d of r, dr, d theta, dA as infinitesimals. Um, but I can't draw the diagram looking infin where all these things look infinitesimally small or I, there wouldn't be anything to see, so I have to draw them fairly large. But I'm imagining this as your angle theta right here. And this is d theta, an infinitesimal change in theta. So really you should think of this ray and this ray as both being at angle theta with an, almost, you know, with this infinitesimal theta in between. And that this distance is r. And then what would happen if you took a small change in r? So here's a dr. And so the question is if you're at if you let theta vary a little bit and you let r vary a little bit, what's the corresponding little blob of area that you get? Well, it's this one. Right? Here's a small change in r. Here's a small change in theta. We're after this, the area of this little curved part. <laughs> it's not so little, but I'd, ideally it would be little and look infinitesimal. And we're after the area of that. Well, um, it's just you need to take this side as dr. If we knew the length of this side, we'd just multiply. Um, yeah, it curves, but infinitesimally it doesn't. You just think of it as a, as a straight line. Um, and so what is this length? Well, theta is measured in radians. And the arc length of this part of a circle in radians is just the radian measure of the angle times the radius. So that length is r d theta. And so this little blob, this infinitesimal little chunk of area right here is dr times r d theta. So we write r d r d theta. You get this. This is called, sometimes you hear this referred to this infinitesimal area as an element of area. It's a classic term for it. Um, you don't, it's not really important that you remember it. I always think of it as an infinitesimal little chunk of area. And that's what it is in polar coordinates. Well, once you know x equals r cosine of theta, y equals r sine of theta, and dA is r dr d theta in polar coordinates, you're all set to do integrals in polar coordinates. So let's look at some. The first one I want to consider, so example, I want to take the double integral of x squared plus y squared dA over the region R, where the region R is a quarter of a disk. So inside of a circle of radius 2 centered at the origin, so in the first quadrant. So here's it's supposed to be <laughs> it's supposed to be a quarter of a disk of radius 2 centered at the origin, and we'd like to integrate that. Now, you're not explicitly, in a lot of these problems, you wouldn't explicitly be told, do this integral in polar coordinates. You should just look at it and know, first of all, the integrand, x squared plus y squared. That's r squared in polar coordinates. That's nice. And you look at this region, and it's easy to describe the inside of a disk in terms of polar coordinates. It's, you get every r, every radius between 0 and 2, and your angles, your angles go from 0 to pi over 2. So, yeah, the region is nice. The integrand is nice in terms of polar coordinates. The region is nice in terms of polar coordinates. Let me write, this is exactly where r is between 0 and 2. 
and theta is between 0 and pi over 2. And this integral in polar coordinates just becomes right, x squared plus y squared is r squared, dA is r dr d theta. If we had to, we put the theta on the inside and the r on the outside, but we don't have to. These are just constants, so theta goes from 0 to pi over 2. R goes from 0 to 2. So you get the integral from 0 to pi over 2. This is r cubed <coughs> dr, so that integrates to r to the fourth over r to the fourth over 4, evaluated from 0 to 2. And after we do that, we still have to integrate with respect to theta. You get 2 to the fourth, that's 16 over 4, that's 4 minus 0. So you get just the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of 4 d theta. That's 4 times, well you just get theta evaluated from 0 to pi over 2. So that's pi over 2. And so you get 2 pi. It's, that integral is very, very simple. In polar coordinates, you could try it in, <coughs> in Cartesian coordinates. It's not that the integrand is bad, but your limits of integration would involve y equals the square root of 4 minus x squared, and then you have to do the integral. It couldn't get any easier than this. All right, let's look at another example. Another one that's clearly one you want to do in polar coordinates, whether someone tells you that's how you have to do it or not. So, two, let's look at the double integral over the region R of x dA, where R is, R is, well, part of an annulus, which is one disk with a smaller disk removed. I'm going to assume that this is the inside of a circle of radius 2 here. So the region R is this one. So this is R. It's, you take what's in the, the second quadrant inside a disk of radius 5. So this is negative 5, this is 5 inside a disk of radius 5, outside a disk of radius 2, in the second quadrant, we want to integrate x. All right, so, um, again, this region is very nice in terms of polar coordinates. Your r's, your radii, are always going from 2 out to 5. And theta, is between pi over 2 and pi. And so this double integral becomes, all right, x is r cosine of theta, r cosine of theta. dA is r dr d theta. Theta goes from pi over 2 to pi. R goes from 2 to 5, and you integrate. So you get the integral from pi over 2 to pi. Cosine of theta is a constant as far as R is concerned. You can pull it all the way out of the integral. And then we're left with, we have to integrate R times R, so that's R squared. You get R cubed over 3, evaluated from 2 to 5 and you still have to integrate with respect to theta. You get the integral from pi over 2 to pi of the cosine of theta times, this is 125, so 5 cubed, 125 thirds minus 8 thirds, um, so 117 thirds d theta. You pull out the 117 thirds, the integral of cosine is sine. We get 117 thirds sine of theta evaluated from pi over 2 to pi. The sine of pi, 
is 0. Um, you subtract what you get at 2 pi. The sine of 2 pi is 1, but that's subtracted. So we end up with negative 117 thirds. <clears throat> you might be somewhat concerned that, oh, that came out negative. Uh, there must be a mistake. No, we weren't finding area. So this isn't obviously wrong. Um, why, in fact, is it obvious that it had to be negative? Well, we were integrating x, and all the x coordinates are negative in this region. So yeah, we could have known ahead of time the answer had to come out to be negative. It would have been bad if we didn't get that minus sign. All right, let's look at another example. In this example, it is not so obvious that you'd like to use polar coordinates. And you could try it with rectangular, but it's an interesting example with polar, and it works out very nicely. And again, you should try it with Cartesian coordinates and see how bad it gets. In this example, I want to take the double integral over the region R of 1 over the square root of x squared plus y squared, dA. And the region R this time is a trapezoid. Now, trapezoids don't look very nice in polar coordinates. Nonetheless, we'll see that this works out very beautifully. So I'm going to take the line y equals x, a vertical line at x equals 1, a vertical line at x equals 2, and look at this trapezoid, r. And I want to calculate the double integral in polar coordinates. Why would, you sus why would one suspect that this would be nice in polar coordinates? Well, certainly this region doesn't look kind of circular or polar in any reasonable fashion. However, the integrand certainly does. x squared plus y squared is r squared. The square root of r squared, we're assuming little r is positive, is just r. So this, in polar coordinates, this integrand is just 1 over r. And then dA is r dr d theta. And the r's will cancel. And we'll just have to integrate dr d theta. So that's really nice. Except now we have to describe this region in polar coordinates. And that is, well, <laughs> it's a little different. So how do you describe this region in polar coordinates? Well, your thetas in this region definitely go from theta equals 0 to, well, the theta where y equals x, that's pi over 4. So theta is between 0 and pi over 4. But then the question is, for each theta between 0 and pi over 4, what do your r coordinates do? So r is the distance from the origin. So when we're at a given theta, where does it where do the r's in the region start? Well, here I am drawing a, a given theta. Your r starts at the, the point on this line, the line where x equals 1, and ends at whatever r is on this line where x equals 2. So that's what we need to do. At each, for each theta, we have to look at the corresponding r on the line x equals 1 and go out to, that's where you start, and your r's end up at the r on this line where x equals 2. Well, so we have to find those. How do you find them? Actually, it's not bad at all. The line x equals 1. Well, in polar coordinates, that's r times cosine of theta equals 1. Well, that's r equals 1 over cosine of theta. That's secant of theta. And when x equals 2, all that changes is you'll get a 2 when x is 2. That's r times cosine of theta equals 2. You divide both sides by cosine of theta and use that 1 over cosine of secant. And you get r is 2 secant of theta. So that's what happens. For a given theta, your r goes from the r on the first line to the r on the second line. So in terms of theta, now we definitely need r on the inside, dr on the inside. Theta is going from 0 to pi over 4. And for each theta between 0 and pi over 4, r starts at secant of theta and goes out to 2 secant of theta. 
All right, the R is canceled here. So this is just the integral of one. Uh, so you just get R and you'll evaluate there and subtract what you get there. So you get two secant of theta minus secant of theta. That's just secant of theta. And we have to integrate from zero to pi over four secant of theta d theta. Now, here's where, here's where things get a little ugly. You have to know the integral of secant. Now, hopefully you memorized it in calculus one. If not, um, you can look it up in a table or do it on some computer algebra system or Wolfram Alpha. One way or the other, you need to get that, that an antiderivative of secant theta is the natural log of the absolute value of secant theta plus tan theta. And you evaluate that as theta goes from 0 to pi over 4. So you get the natural log of, all right, the secant of pi over 4. That's 1 over cosine of pi over 4. That's 1 over 1 over the square root of 2. So that's the square root of 2. Plus the tan of pi over 4. That's 1. Minus what you get at 0, which is the natural log of the absolute value of secant of 0, 1 over cosine of 0, that's 1, plus tangent of 0, which is 0. So you get the natural log of 1, that's 0, and so you're just left with the natural log of the square root of 2 plus 1. And that's the answer. So, yeah, it was easy, modulo knowing the integral of secant of theta, which either you have to know or find out somehow. All right, I want to do one last example. It's a classic example of using integration in polar coordinates. It will, in fact, be an improper integral. We will go out to minus in, from minus infinity to infinity. And in fact, the problem starts out as a single integral, but we'll see what happens. So it would be nice if you remembered from, oh, single variable calculus, that e to the minus x squared has no elementary antiderivative. That means that there's no nice formula that you can write for, so here's another example. There's no nice formula that you can write for this. Tough. There's just just doesn't exist. So no finite combination of, of functions that we've given names to and that are the ones that we study all the time in calculus and physics. All right, so what? Well, in fact, this integral, at least the definite integral, from minus infinity to infinity is extremely important in probability and statistics. It has to do with the normal distribution and the question is, can you figure out what this definite integral equals when you can't come up with a nice formula for an antiderivative of e to the minus x squared? And the answer is yes. And strangely, <laughs> double integrals and polar coordinates give it to you. So what do you do? Well, you get tricky. And when I say tricky, I mean very tricky. So let's call the value of this i, assuming it has one. You can actually prove that it exists without too much trouble. Getting a nice expression for it is something else, but um, we'll assume that it exists and then see what it is. So the x here is a dummy variable. We could have called it anything. You know, it could have been minus banana squared d banana, as banana goes from minus infinity to infinity. But let's use something more reasonable than banana. It's true that i is also the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus y squared dy. Well, that was exciting. We just changed the x's to y's. How does that help? Well, <laughs> it helps because if you now multiply them, you get that i squared should be the integral from minus infinity to infinity, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus x squared. You multiply the integrands, and then the exponents add e to the minus x squared minus y squared dx dy. But now this is set up very nicely for integration in polar coordinates. This minus x squared minus y squared is the same as minus the quantity x squared plus y squared. 
And so what we get is this is e to the minus in polar coordinates, that's r squared. dx dy is dA in Cartesian coordinates, but dA in polar coordinates is r dr d theta. And the nice thing <coughs> here is that this extra r comes in, and that will enable us to calculate an antiderivative here by substitution fairly easily. What, what about the limits of integration? You have to think about your region. Our region in x and y coordinates, x was between minus infinity and infinity, y was between minus infinity and infinity. So we're integrating over the entire xy plane, all of it. In r and theta, how do you get the entire xy plane? You let r start at zero and go out to infinity, and you let theta go all the way around. So r goes from minus infinity to infinity, but theta goes from zero to two pi. Now, we're gonna calculate this. This will be i squared, and then we'll take the square root to get the value of i. This is an incredibly cool trick. So, we need to do this inside integral. It's an improper integral. Um, oh, sorry, I, ha ha. I think I said r goes from zero to infinity, but I wrote minus infinity to infinity. That would have caused, that would have given us the region twice. So no, we just want to go from zero to infinity. Um, we need to do that inside integral. It's improper because of that infinity up there. But if we just work with it properly, I won't even explicitly write a limit as we approach infinity. We'll just keep in mind that that's what we mean. So let me do that integral off to the side and plug in the answer back in the other calculation. So off to the side, I want to do, I want to calculate the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative r squared times r dr, this. Okay, the substitution that you make is you let u be the minus r squared so that du is minus 2r dr. We have an r dr. In fact, that r is why we switched into polar coordinates. It made the integral doable for us. We get minus 1 half du is r dr. And this integral, in terms of u, becomes e to the u. And then r dr is minus 1 half du. And we'll switch our limits of integration to describing what u does. When r starts at zero, but that means u starts at minus zero squared, so that's zero. r goes to infinity, so that means u goes to minus infinity squared, so minus infinity. So this. So we get, pull out the minus one half, the integral of e to the u du, you just get e to the u, and you evaluate as u goes from zero to minus infinity. We get minus a half times e to the minus infinity. You should think one over e to the infinity, one over something really big, zero. Minus what you get when u is zero, which is one. So I get minus, so I get a half. So that integral is a half. And I'll come back in over here and put in then that this inside integral is a half. We get the integral from zero to two pi of one half d theta. You pull out the one half, the integral of d theta is just theta evaluated from zero to two pi. You just get two pi multiplied times a half, pi. So what did we just find? We just found that i squared is pi. <laughs> so i, this integral that's so important, this definite integral that's so important in probability and statistics, its value is just the square root of pi. Um, would you recognize, you know, you could approximate this on a calculator. Um, I don't, I wouldn't recognize the square root of pi as a decimal if I saw it. I doubt that you would. But that's what the integral equals. Um, those are examples of of um, integration in polar coordinates. It's uh, not all integrals are nice in polar coordinates. You're not always told whether to switch into polar coordinates or leave your problem in
Cartesian coordinates. You want an integrand that looks reasonable. If you replace all the x's and y's by r cosine theta and r sine theta, or x squared plus y squared by r squared. Um, you want a region that's not too awful to describe in polar coordinates. We did a trapezoid, which wasn't easy, but it wasn't so bad. Um, and then lots of integrals become much nicer in polar coordinates, but you have to, you have to know when to use them and when not to.